trying to say that for, for me, um, not dead yet has been just the saving grace in terms of, and you know, our outcome hasn't been so wonderful this year in Vermont, but um, through the last 12 years has been so, so um, helpful to our cause. And, um, and Diane Coleman is just a legend here in our movement, so we're very lucky to have her with us today. So go ahead, Diane. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Really, you guys, having worked on this in the trenches, are so amazing for me to, to work with you. Um, so I wanted to give you guys a little history, because I think it kind of helps to frame uh, the discussion, and it makes it easier to talk about what we need to do. My first involvement as a disability activist in issues that could be described as related to assisted suicide concerned the case of Elizabeth Bouvet. I was an attorney in Los Angeles in 1985, and I volunteered as a member of the board of a large Center for Independent Living. The center's executive director contacted me about this case, explaining that Elizabeth Bouvet was a 26-year-old woman with cerebral palsy who had been through a miscarriage, marriage breakup, and other setbacks in her personal life including the state rehab agency taking back her accessible van and effectively blocking her plans to attend a master's degree program. So she'd gone to a local hospital asking to be allowed to starve herself to death while receiving comfort care and pain medication. The hospital refused to go along, but they admitted her. Then she contacted the Southern California ACLU and they arranged for a Hemlock Society lawyer to take her so-called right to die case. I was asked to join in a disability rights picket at the ACLU's Los Angeles office. Now, as a card-carrying member of the ACLU at the time, I was shocked. Miscarriage, marriage breakup. If Ms. Bouvet had been non-disabled, she would have gotten help to get through those setbacks. The discrimination was obvious to disability activists, but not to the ACLU, not to the media, not to the general public. Fortunately, Ms. Bouvet's so-called right to die by refusing food and water was new legal territory back then, and so it took a couple years to get through the courts. The California Appellate Court ultimately compared Ms. Bouvet not to a suicidal person needing suicide prevention, but to a terminally ill person in a helpless, hopeless condition, granting her the right to starve herself to death in a hospital setting while receiving morphine and comfort care. But by then, she didn't go through with it. Her supposedly firm and subtle decision to die had changed after all, just as with most suicidal people. Now, bioethicists keep telling the Elizabeth Bouvet story, but they usually leave out the key facts of her life and the blatant discrimination in the way she was treated compared to a non-disabled young woman facing similar setbacks. This case served as a wake-up call to the disability community. Also in the 1980s, several cases went through the courts involving young men with quadriplegia on ventilators. These men were stuck in nursing facilities against their will, or they feared winding up in a facility as their support systems failed, and they sought the right to turn off the ventilator. Some of them very directly said they wanted to get out of the facility or else pull the plug. In case after case, the courts painstakingly analyzed how the usual state interest in preserving life and preventing suicide did not apply to these men, while once never questioning their involuntary confinement in nursing facilities. In each case, the court found that their liberty rights included the liberty to die, but apparently not the liberty to live free. In only one case, that of Larry McAfee, were disability activists able to intervene and help him get out of the facility. Bioethicists write about the case, but they leave out the fight for his freedom and what made it happen, 
which was the ADAPT disability rights activist in Atlanta, headed up by Mark Johnson, a man who's quadriplegic and works at the Shepherd Spinal Center. And they don't mention Mr. McAfee's later testimony before the state legislature about how he was treated like a second-class citizen, shuttled from one nursing facility to another, including out-of-state facilities for Medicaid policy reasons. We call these the give me liberty or give me death cases. They appeared throughout the 1980s and disability activists presented a critical analysis in every available venue of how these men were devalued and mistreated. While we don't oppose the right to refuse treatment based on informed consent, we question the coercive pressures placed on these men and others. Disability groups object to the implicit claim that any of us need to die to have dignity. Needing help in dressing, bathing, and other intimate daily tasks does not rob a person of autonomy and dignity. Unfortunately, popular culture has done virtually nothing to educate the public about how people with severe disabilities actually live autonomous and dignified lives. Our lives are portrayed as tragedies, or sensationalized as heroism, but the real life issues and coping styles that most people will need if they live long enough are left out of the picture. No wonder people who acquire disabilities so often see death as the only viable solution. This has led to plenty of distortion and criticism of the disability activist position. But not in October 2004, so many years after those cases, one of the bioethicists who was active in the case of David Rivlin, a guy named Dr. Howard Brody, wrote a belated apology in the Lansing City Pulse. Quote, this is the key lesson that disabilities advocates are trying to teach the rest of us. If we look at a case one way, it seems that the problem is the person's physical disability. But if we shift our view, we realize that the problem is not the disability, but rather the refusal of society to make reasonable and not terribly expensive accommodations to it. There's every reason to believe in hindsight that David Rivlin died unnecessarily, and that we who claim to care about his rights should have been demanding that services be made available to him rather than that he be allowed to die. As one who argued the wrong thing back then, I apologize for my short-sightedness. Well, too little too late. Flash forward to the late 90s for the story of my former co-worker, Terry Lincoln, who along with her family was repeatedly pressured to pull the plug on the ventilator that she needed the first few months after her spinal cord injury. How many families are willing to be accused of being selfish and making their loved ones suffer and are able to argue and fight for the life of their loved one against the authority and smooth-talking style of doctors and hospital administrators? Terry survived, weaned off the ventilator, finished her education, got a job, and is now raising her baby daughter. But how many people with disabilities have died under these pressures without having the chance to live and enjoy life that Terry got? The reason that so many national disability organizations have taken a stand alongside Not Dead Yet, that so many of us know people who survived these pressures and we knew others who have not. The 90s also brought us Jack Kevorkian and many of us who followed the issue closely were horrified to see him embraced by progressive journalists like Mike Wallace of 60 Minutes and Barbara Walters. And while he was constantly described as helping terminally ill people die, even the New York England Journal of Medicine published a study documenting that two-thirds of his body count was people with disabilities who were not terminal at all. In the mid-90s, we knew that we would need to do more than write articles and court briefs, more than give workshops at conferences 
and speak to the occasional reporter. It became clear that we would need a group that would focus on this issue and add the tactics of nonviolent direct action to our efforts. When Bob Kafka, one of National Adapt's leaders, said, I've got a name for your group from the Monty Python and the Holy Grail movie, that day in April 1997, Not Dead Yet began. For the last three decades, assisted suicide proponents have told the press and the public that it's about compassionate progressives versus the religious right, and they've equated their proposals with patient autonomy and the right to die. It's a simple message, easy to convey, if one doesn't mind ignoring inconvenient facts. Like the pressure to reduce health care costs while sustaining health care industry and managed care profits. Like the documented reality that predictions that someone will die in six months are often wrong. Like the documented reality that people who want to die usually have treatable depression, whether they're terminal or not. Like the documented reality that elder abuse is a growing problem and most frequent perpetrators are a spouse or adult child. It's not so simple to talk about those things, but we must. Disabled people are in a unique position, caught between progressives and conservatives who don't get it. Too often our liberal and progressive allies on other issues oversimplify the dangers facing elders and disabled people who depend on others for basic needs. Meanwhile, conservative politicians who see assisted suicide and euthanasia as violating their principles see no contradiction as they slash budgets for health care that we need to survive, which is nothing less than backdoor euthanasia. Disability rights groups have a unique perspective informed by both our principles and our experiences. Our principles embrace non-discrimination civil rights, and self-determination. Our collective experiences include monumental struggles against the crushing oppression of a healthcare system that devalues us and a society that fears significant disability as a fate worse than death. We're consumers on the front lines of the healthcare system facing other people's worst fears with grace and dignity Yet we've been pushed to the margins, accused of conflating disability and terminal illness, and even excluded outright from the debate on these issues. Fortunately, in Vermont and Massachusetts, the disability community was front and center in the public debate on assisted suicide, sought out by the press for the insights you articulated so forcefully so really, I want to thank you, Sarah and John, and learn from you because you've been in the trenches taking this discussion to the next level. So thank you. So I think I'm up next. Then we'll stop watch, get the feedback going. So. <laughs>